Welcome to the Dark Goddess where we celebrate the women who dared to live differently. We have another great woman from the 1907 Zigfield Follies, Annabelle Whitford, the scandalous She Wouldn't Girl. Imagine being a 17-year-old burlesque dancer who introduced Americans to exotic dance and then created a national scandal by refusing to take off her clothes at a high society party. This is the remarkable story of Annabelle, the first movie star in a color movie produced by none other than Thomas Edison. She was the first Gibson girl, the original Nell Brinkley girl, and the personification of the Christie girl. Annabelle first won fame as a child dancer known as Baby Annabelle at age 11. She was in demand at society functions. She grew up on the stage. She had a show business mom. Her birth dad, Edward P. Whitford, had passed on when she was born. Her mother, Amanda Pittman, had led Amazon-type women in a glittering burlesque. Being on stage was normal and natural for Annabelle. Doing Lois Fuller's skirt dance seemed like the right thing for her to do. Her mother remarried when Annabelle was 11 years old to William S. Moore. And Annabelle, for a time, used her stepfather's last name. She had a busy early life, not only on stage, but also as a model. Charles Dane Gibson used her for his Gibson girl, and Nell Brinkley had her model for her famous Betty character seen daily in newspapers nationwide. As a young teenager, Annabelle decided to be a dancer and began performing the Lois Fuller skirt dance. As she danced up and down the stage, her skirt would change colors as she passed by colored lights. It may seem strange today, but back in 1893, electric light bulbs were still a new thing to most people. People knew of candlelight and even gaslight, but electric lights, not so much let alone colored spotlights. And even today, her dance, as it was recorded by Thomas Edison, still exists on YouTube. And it still works. Annabelle was famous for her skirt dance then, and she is still today. Her talents gained her a reputation and opportunities. In fact, at age 14, Miss Annabelle Moore comes to the world's attention at the Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, a.k.a. the Chicago World's Fair, in 1893, where she introduced skirt dance exotic burlesque to the world. She was the talk of the exposition. And there was another young teenage gal getting attention at the expo, and that was Little Egypt. Catherine Devine took on the show name of Ashia Wabi and appeared as Little Egypt. There were others. She once stated, quote, It is just this way. There are four Little Egypts in this country, three in Chicago and one in Minneapolis. 
They claim to be Little Egypt, but I am the genuine one." End quote. Despite her claim, <laughs> she was probably one of several rotating dancers doing Little Egypt in the Egyptian theater during the Expo. And it must have been something to watch. Some people claimed that they had seen her dance the Hoochie Goo in the nude, wearing nothing but a diamond garter. Legend has it that Mark Twain suffered a coronary after seeing her dance. But the actual historical facts of Little Egypt are scarce. Just a little perspective here. This was America's first major introduction to belly dancing. Legend has it that Little Egypt both scandalized and delighted visitors when she danced at the Expo's Egyptian theater. Further, it inspired the Expo's entertainment director and later U.S. Congressman Sol Bloom to coin the term belly dancing. Well, now you know where that term comes from, huh? Which was known previously to many Americans as the hoochie coochie dance. The hoochie coo is a catch-all term used to describe the sexually provocative belly dancing. Little Egypt inspired Bloom to write the lyrics of a popular song, which goes in part, There is a place in France where the women wear no pants, where the naked ladies dance, etc. Well, you get the idea. Asha Wabi, as the nude Little Egypt, was later to intersect with Annabelle again in a huge scandal. After the 1893 Expo, Annabelle moved to New York and connected up with Thomas Edison and made her first film at age 16. She would later perform for the famed Biograph Studios. Edison marketed his films everywhere in his new 1887 device called the Kinetoscope. The public would pay $6 in today's money to watch a short film clip. Remember, this was before movie theaters. People had never seen a moving picture before. And there was Annabelle. They couldn't get enough. Her dance films totally wore out from overuse in the kinetoscope. Edison had to send out new prints to replace the worn prints. So much so that the negatives even worn out as well. Annabelle had to come in and perform for the cameras again and again. <laughs> it was said that she introduced eroticism in film. Sex sells and Edison knew it and made a ton of money from his Annabelle films. The sale of her Edison films was further boosted in December 1896 when it was revealed in a scandal that made all the newspapers that she had been approached to appear naked in a private high society sealy dinner party at Sherry's restaurant. Annabelle and Little Egypt were nationwide icons. And a certain group of men wanted them to dance at their dinner party. They were offering $607 for their services. According to later court testimony, 17-year-old Annabelle said, quote, My stepfather told me that Mr. Lyman had an engagement for me to dance at Sherry's at midnight. I called on Mr. Lyman at his office. She goes on to say, He said it would be a party of 22 men, he asked, if I did high kicking. I said, yes. Mr. Phelps entered the office with another man, and I told them what dances I did. And Mr. Phelps said, yes, uh, that is very good. 
We want you to do something more. We want you to dance nude from the waist down. He said that little Egypt was going to dance as he wanted her to. I could not speak in answer to Mr. Phelps at first. Then I said, I would not do what they wanted. Mr. Phelps asked if mm, I could not arrange to drop my tights at the end of the dance, saying that by that time the men would be so drunk that it wouldn't make any difference what I did. I got out of that office as well as I could and went straight to my stepfather's office and told him I had been grossly insulted." End quote. Mr. Moore was furious and went straight to police captain Chapman and told him of the event that was going to take place at Sherry's, telling him that Little Egypt was scheduled in the All Together. Captain Chapman said he would stop the event. And so, on that cold dark night of December 19, 1896, many of the richest men in New York City were enjoying themselves at a bachelor party. Suddenly, the event was raided by the police. Little Egypt later testified in court that she was nude and wore only a costume of gauze, which she said was quite transparent. Witnesses said that a dozen men followed her into the dressing room, where she retired from the stage and pulled off her costume of gauze and pulled her around the room. She said, quote, they mauled me and tossed me about but they took no liberties at all, end quote. <laughs> Besides Little Egypt, singer Lottie Mortimer also performed fully exposed to the men. For her encore dance, Little Egypt said, quote, I was to dance entirely nude except for silk stockings and slippers, but the police had arrived. <laughs> The newspapers reported, quote, from the Harlem to the Bowery, from the East to the North River, the Sealy Dinner is being discussed over cold coffee, hot toddy, in the pulpit, and in the depths of the Bowery. Little Egypt, the darling of the Johnnies, who was the central figure at the Sealy Dinner at Sherry's, and she told all, Everybody was reading her account, how she was thrilled and delighted over the score of Bachelors on that memorial night of March 19, 1894. Picture cards of her sold out all over the city. Billy dancing had its official American birth, and Annabelle became the famous She Wouldn't Girl. Then, during the trial, Annabelle's stepfather, Sir, came to a cold contracted during the Chapman trial and died. He was just 52. Annabelle was devastated. In 1899, she announced her engagement to Baron Wenzla van Werdenberg of Austria, Hungary. She said they had just met three weeks previously, but the marriage apparently never happened. Five years later, in 1904, she announced her engagement to the very wealthy Harry Bissing, head of the Bissing Electric Company in New York. The marriage lasted for about five years, and for whatever reason, it ended. During these years of engagement and marriage, Annabelle changed her stage name back to her birth name, Annabelle Whitford. And can you blame her? Apparently she wanted to distance herself from failed marriage, the death of her stepfather, and the scandalous trial. Anna continued to make news, however, while performing 
the Queen of Fairies in Mr. Blackbird at the Iroquois Theater in Philadelphia in 1903. That magnificent building burnt down, claiming scores of lives. Initially, it was misreported that Annabelle had been one of those mortally wounded. But reports of her death were very premature. She would live for nearly 60 more decades, until 1961. The initial reports had been confused with another Annabelle who had died in the fire. Annabelle was selected by Florence Zingfield for the premiere of his Follies in 1907 for three reasons. One, her fame. Two, her talent. Three, her resemblance to the Gibson Girl. Annabelle started as the Gibson Bathing Girl in the first of the Zingfield Follies, 1907 and popularized the song That's Why They Call Me The Gibson Girl. In the next Follies of 1908, she was the Nell Brinkley Girl, the new, new girl, as the Gibson Girl was fading. Annabelle was reported to have earned upwards of $26,370 in today's money her week with Zigfield. In the Follies of 1909, Annabelle played Venus surrounded by various pretty girls as goddesses in the first act and was a hit later on in the show as the Brinkley Bathing Girl. In 1909, her last year with the Follies, she was on stage with one of the most salaried women comedians in the world, Eva Canway, the girl who made vaudeville famous. And Eva had a well-planned assault on the stuffy Victorian convention. More about her in another chapter. Despite the high salaries of Annabelle and Eva, both would, decades later, die penniless living in devastating poverty after being largely forgotten. But during the 1900s, Annabelle had a huge cult following. People couldn't get enough of her. She had a way of morphing into whatever the new girl was. It was a time when women were being redefined and continually transformed. From the Victorian woman to the Edwardian woman to the Gibson girl to the Nell Brinkley girl, and all eventually leading to the 1920s flapper. It was quite a journey. Annabelle served as the role model from one type of woman to the next. She was the embodiment of the ever-evolving new girl of her time, and she knew it, and she capitalized on it. In 1910, she was one of Oscar Hammerstein's prima donnas in his light opera company. A huge honor. In her 1910 various stage shows, Annabelle, the original Gibson girl, and Neil Brinkley girl, did skits as the flirting girl, the newspaper girl, the aeroplane girl. Just a little perspective here. It had been a mere seven years earlier that the Wright brothers had famously taken wing in their first powered aircraft at Kitty Hawk. And here was Annabelle turning off all the stage lights in the auditorium except for one spotlight which shone on the airplane which she flew over the heads of the audience and sang. The plane was on a track, of course, but she had claimed flight for women. Audiences went wild. It can be said she opened the door for women in flight. Plastic surgery? Nearly unheard of in 1910. But Annabelle went under the knife and had her natural dimples removed. 
Many women at that time had doctors give them artificial dimples. But Annabelle, being the trendsetter that she was, went in the other direction and had New York Dr. W. Herbert Miller make a small incision and eradicate hers. She remained active until her marriage and subsequent retirement in 1912. She retired to Chicago with her new husband, Dr. Edward Buchan, who was two years her younger. Interestingly, they both developed severe arthritis in their senior years. They lived on just old age assistance. He died in 1958, and she passed away four years later in 1961. She was penniless due to misfortune and bad investments. She leaves us an example of artistic passion connected to integrity. Annabelle and her influence live on, captured forever in her colorful dance films in cinematic history and even on YouTube. She, more than most, helped define the new woman for an entire generation. We are forever grateful for her. This has been The Dark Goddess, where we dare you to live differently. Live your true self.